Good evening. It is so wonderful to see so many faces from around the Episcopal Diocese of Oregon, the school community, the Portland area, and beyond, Salem I'm seeing, yeah, maybe even farther away. Welcome. My name is Father Robert Bryant. I'm the rector, which just means priest in charge here at uh, the Episcopal Parish of St. John the Baptist, where tradition welcomes diversity. And uh, we have been here on this campus uh, since 1964, uh, the campus of Oregon Episcopal School, and it's always been such a great joy and delight to uh, share this space and to partner and collaborate with the school. Um, tonight, for this I I presentation, we are partnering not only with OES, but with the larger uh, Diocese of Oregon to present this special conversation between uh, the world-renowned presiding bishop, Michael Curry. <laughs> <laughs> our, own, our own amazing bishop, Diana Akiyama. <laughs> and the incomparable Jeff Norcross from Oregon Public Broadcasting. Right. <laughs> And uh, before I forget, let me invite you to join me in silencing electronic devices. And would also ask that you refrain from taking photographs uh, during this conversation. There are uh, professional photographers here, you may have noticed, who will c capture the spirit of this evening. It is being uh, live streamed, both on the diocesan YouTube and Facebook page, and will be recorded for future viewing. Housekeeping. Um, if you would, if you so need, there are two restrooms on the hallway on the other side of this wall. There are double doors back there behind you that you can go down the hallway. There are two restrooms, and there is a water cooler, just in case. Hopefully, that will meet most of your needs. Before we begin on this um, 21st anniversary of 9/11, it seems like appropriate to take a moment and uh, to start with prayer. Uh, from with the wonderful, powerful, and healing words of our Book of Common Prayer. Let us pray. O oh God, you made us in your own image and redeemed us through your Son, Jesus Christ. Look with compassion on the whole human family Take away the arrogance and hatred which infect our hearts. Break down the walls that separate us. Unite us in bonds of love. And work through our struggle and confusion to accomplish your purposes on earth, that in your good time all nations and races may serve you in harmony around your heavenly throne, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. And so let's begin our program. Please join me in welcoming uh, OPB's Morning Edition anchor, Jeff Norcross. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Father Robert. Uh, it, is a, it is an absolute pleasure and an honor to be with you this evening and to speak to these two trailblazers. Uh, Let's not mince words. I mean, it's not very often that you see the leadership of any church, any church, who look like them. <laughs> and so we'll, we'll talk about that. Uh, and we'll talk about a lot of things. Um, just a little bit of context, though, for this conversation. Uh, it's great to see all of you here in the, in the, uh, in the, uh, in the, in the hall at uh, St. John the Baptist, and it's great to see everybody on the stream. Uh, I'm coming at this as a, uh, as a broadcaster and as a journalist, and this conversation is also being recorded for a future episode of OPB's Think Out Loud. So I'm gonna be asking questions that are kind of in the mold of uh, a journalist, and how the role of the church fits into a lot of the events that we are going through together right now. And so we'll touch on many of these big issues. And uh, we're looking at having a conversation that is um, of relevance to lots of people, not you know the faithful and the unfaithful alike. So that's that's where we are with that. So let's let's dive right in. And uh, 
I, I'd love to hear from both of you and, and explore your, your personal stories a little bit. I, I'm, I'm curious what drew both of you to the priesthood uh, and to the Episcopal Church particularly. And uh, Bishop Curry, why don't we start with you? So you want the priesthood or the Episcopal Church? Uh, well, let's start with the priesthood, but why this church particularly? Well, but thank you for having us. And, um, um, you know, now that I think about it, I guess we don't look like... Um, I, <laughs> I sort of fancy myself a Denzel Washington lookalike. But, and, <laughs> and so, <laughs> I, I thought that's what he meant. Yeah. So good looking. I, yeah, it's a good looking. That's right. <laughs> it's a... Well, my journey to the priesthood um, had a lot of twists and turns, and, um, but um, it probably is linked to my family. My father was a priest, um, and um, he grew up Baptist, as did my mother, actually, um, and both of them became Episcopalian later, and in, 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 her, in her case, it was, um, my mother was a mathematician, and she was in graduate school, and um, s somebody put a copy of C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity which was kind of hot off the press then. This is, I don't know, late 40s, early 50s. And, um, and the logic of C.S. Lewis that, that um, kind of attracted her. I mean, she was already a Christian, but that the Episcopal Church was something new. And so anyway, she became Episcopalian, and then when she and my father were dating, she eventually was the one who brought him. But what really convinced him was uh, he went in Episcopal Church with her. This is in the 19, late 40s. Um, this is before, um, I mean, Martin Luther King was still in seminary. So this is, this is still early. This was in southern Ohio, which southern Ohio was south. <laughs> um, and um, so she went to church with him, and they were probably the only black folk or people of color um, in the congregation, I'm guessing. Anyway, he, um, everything was kind of normal. I mean, he did say it was a little bit boring and quiet, but uh, <laughs> that's... That's us, the Episcopal Church. That's us. <laughs> the Episcopal Church welcomes you, but very quietly. And it's a, it's a, so, so he's sitting in church, and time came for communion. And, and in those days, people went up to the altar rail and, and knelt down, and the priest would come along with the bread, and then they would come along with the wine, which was in a common cup, which for a Baptist was something new. And so he saw this, but then he realized, wait a minute, that... My mother was up there, and she was a person of color. This is in southern Ohio, and these folk are drinking out of the same cup. And so he was watching to see what would happen when Rosa Parks sipped from that cup. <laughs> <laughs> and what he saw was that people took the bread just like normal, and then they took the wine and drank out of the cup, and nobody batted an eye. And he would say, when he would tell that story, he would say, any church where black folk and white folk can drink from the same cup in southern Ohio in the late 1940s is a church that knows something about the gospel of Jesus that I want to be a part of. That's how we became Episcopalian, and I was born several years later. Um, but that's why, and so most, much of his ministry was in work of justice, reconciliation, around civil rights for the most part. Um, and so I went. A lot off of people were drawn to the priesthood at that time because, at, for that reason, for that very reason, <laughs> for that very reason. So I, I imbibe that. That's why I say that's part of my story. <clears throat> but I went to college thinking I was going to law school, um, and um, I had been had been a volunteer for Bobby Kennedy's campaign. Um, so this, we're going back in time, and so I sort of fancied a life in government, probably running for political office of some kind. Um, and um, and then midway through seminary. Um, Somebody put the actual writings of, of Dr. King. A book had been published about his, his theological thought called Search for the Beloved Community. And I read that book and said, wow. I mean, I knew King, who King was. Actually went to a, a, a time, my daddy took me to, he was speaking in Rochester, I think, and we went, and I was about five years old, I think, and um, all the other preachers had to get up and preach first, and King was like the last person to speak. And when you're five years old and a bunch of preachers are talking, <laughs> That's time for a nap. So <laughs> I never heard him speak. I was asleep. I mean, <laughs> but the long and short of it is I realized that my vocation was to kind of live and proclaim the gospel in a way that actually transforms lives both personally and our life socially and globally. And that's led me to the priesthood. Mm. Bishop Akiyama, how about you? 
Um, <clears throat> I, I think I'll start the other way. My, uh, my grandparents on my father's side were Buddhist, and my mother's family was Methodist. And when the Japanese were interned during World War II, my grandfather was taken along with a number of Issei who were suspected of being leaders of the Japanese community. So he was in <coughs> jail here in Portland. And when my grandmother went to visit him, he told her to get the kids baptized. Now, this wasn't because he suddenly had um, a spiritual religious experience in prison. He um, realized that perhaps if, if she had all the kids baptized, they would reassure Americans that they were American. So she came back and had my father and his siblings all baptized in the Methodist um, church. My mother went to nurses training at Good Sam here in Portland when it was still part of the Episcopal Diocese here. And that's when she was exposed to our liturgy and music. And that changed uh, for her entirely, her, her sense of the sacred and the holy and what it meant to be a Christian. So she changed um, to the Episcopal Church and that was a church we were all raised in. <clears throat> when I was, um, my first job out of college, I was a drug and alcohol rehab counselor and was pretty sure that I was going to become a psychologist. That was kind of my interest. And I had a number of experiences as a counselor that made me realize that there was something more about um, healing that I was interested in beyond um, just the physical recovery from addiction, that there was a dimension that was spiritual and uh, that had so much more to do with human wholeness that I wanted to be a part of. So I went back to my home church in Hood River. At the time, I was working in Longview, Washington, and um, started meeting with the rector of that church and began discernment. So it was an, inter it's an interesting contrast to yours. I wasn't uh, mobilized necessarily by a political vision. I was um, very concerned about people who were wounded and felt broken. You, you both have personal histories that intersect <laughs> with some of the most shameful moments of our history. And Bishop, Bishop Akiyama, you mentioned that your, your grandparents and the, the boy who would eventually become your father were sent to Japanese concentration camp. And Bishop Curry, you are descended from enslaved Africans. Uh, and I'm wondering how these traumas figure into your decisions to enter the priesthood. Uh, you know, I, I, so I think a lot of it is hindsight. I don't think for me I had um, completely internalized and understood the impact of all of that on me at, at that age. Um, I will say when I was in seminary, one of the things that a number of my other Sansei seminarians and I were able to do, and they, they were not all in the Episcopal Seminary, um, they were in other seminaries, but we're all Sansei, third generation, and we realized that there was a trauma that we were all carrying with us. We'd never been interned. We weren't born when our parents were in camp, but that we were all carrying a trauma from that experience. And so we started a project for all the, the Japanese Americans in our generation in the kind of Bay Area to bring them <coughs> together to tell their stories and to listen to each other and, and lift them up in a way that allowed people to begin finding their voice and feeling like they were recovering from something that for um, generations had felt like shame and um, some kind of strange embarrassment that could not be talked about. Hmm. Hmm. Bishop Akiyama, you were the first Asian American woman to become an Episcopal bishop in the United States. And Bishop Curry, you're the first African American to lead the Episcopal Church in America. Uh, the church by this point has this tradition of welcoming leadership that you don't normally see. Uh, and I'm thinking of the consecration of Eugene Robinson as the first openly gay bishop in the church back in 2003. So you've been doing this for a while. Where does that openness come from, Bishop Curry? Where, where, does, the where does that openness come from? In the church? Yes. I have a feeling it's God. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> it must be said, though, the same God that some will use to exclude instead of include. Well, yeah, but, but God has a way of biding his time. <laughs> <laughs> you know, 
I, in, in a strange kind of way, I, I do think, I think um, um, God has a way of working over time through people, through institutions, through communities, and has a way. Um, and, you know, my grandma used to say, quote, in the Acts of the Apostles, God's always going to have a witness. <laughs> God's always going to have a witness. And it may be in time before something happens. I mean, my grandmother never imagined Barack Obama. Mm -hmm. that, that wasn't, you know, you think about it. So, you know, you, you keep working and keep working for what is just and what is kind and what is decent and what is loving. You keep laboring for that, and you don't give up. I mean, I was raised to understand the only thing you don't do is quit. You don't quit. <laughs> you just keep the struggle. The struggle keeps on. A friend of mine used to write letters, um, and at the end, the struggle continues. <laughs> and, 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 and it does. Um, I mean, you were born in struggle. Um, if you don't believe me, ask your mama. Uh, <laughs> right? I mean, we don't call it labor for no reason. I mean, <laughs> it's, uh, right? and so the reality is that that is the nature of life itself. And we who follow Jesus of Nazareth follow somebody who had to struggle. He, I mean, he, there was struggle. I don't think the crucifixion was a party. You know, <laughs> it was struggle. Um, so that's the nat that's just the nature of human existence. And I think the Episcopal Church, like other churches, like it, and like this country. Um, you know, um, the reality is we got some history and we got some bad history. And, and we have to face that together. Uh, we don't have to wallow in it, but we must learn from it. If you don't ignore it, and, and this is where I lean in your direction, that you, if you don't pay attention to trauma in the past, it's going to get you later. It's going to get you in unknown, uncertain ways. We used to think things like generational trauma were, oh, that's a fiction. That's not really true. Uh-uh, uh-uh. Stuff gets passed. I don't know whether it's in utero or not. I have no idea about that. All I know is trauma of the past can get passed on to the future, into the, fu the present and the future until you name it and deal with it. If you look at some of the healings of Jesus in the New Testament, he asks the demons, what's your name? And when he starts to name them, when he exposes them to the light of day, they begin to lose their power. They may not go away completely, but they begin to lose. And America must face what we have done to indigenous Americans America must face what we have done to women. America must face what we have done to LGBTQ folk. America must face what we have done to various peoples of color. Not to beat up on each other, but that to face the painful truths, name them, expose them to the light of day. Because when they are exposed to the light of day, they do lose their power. And then to learn from that past and join hands together in all of our diversity to build and construct a new future where what happened to your grandparents never happens again. What happened to my aunt never happens again. What happened to a lot, Matthew Shepard, never happens again. What is going on never happens again. That's how you get, you don't get it by just wishing it. You get it by doing that, that kind of hard work. Well, the last couple of years have certainly exposed and intensified a lot of fault lines in America, especially when it comes to equity, civil rights, and the treatment of communities of color by the police. So what do you see the role of the church in an era of Black Lives Matter? How much time you got? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, how can well, the Episcopal Church move the conversation on that? Well, the Episcopal, well, you can move the conversation, again, in local communities, and I don't want to speak for here. I don't want to, uh, I'll let the bishop do that. But um, you, you move it by being in the midst of, let me say it theologically first. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Jesus, which is to say God came here. He didn't say, I'm going to have to sit back and watch. God got in the midst of the fray, in the midst of the mess. That's what Christmas is about. <laughs> it's about getting in the midst of it and helping, trying to help to redeem it by sharing the values and the life that we hope can transform. And so the church and church folk must be involved in civic discourse, in the, in the work of communities that actually seek to make justice real. We have to be involved from the perspective of our values um, and the values that we share, not just as, as Christian people, but there are values that we share um, in this country. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I know Jeff Thomas Jefferson was a hypocrite, he didn't live up to that, but the words are true. And those values we share in this country. So let's make those values tangible reality, living reality for everybody. And the way you do that is you got to get in the midst of the fray. 
And, and, and so you got to participate in the, in, in the body politic, got to participate in the economic debates and structures, got to participate. And so churches have to get, I know that's going to get us in trouble sometime, but that's all right. Jesus didn't get crucified because he wasn't in trouble. <laughs> 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 Last time I checked, we're supposed to be following him. Now, I'm, I'm not talking about being ridiculous, but I am <laughs> saying we've got to be involved in the life of the world and in the life of our communities and how, what that looks like will differ. And involved in ways that seek justice, but justice from the perspective of love. That, that seek justice. Uh, as a friend of mine once said, justice must be done, but justice by itself is not enough. The goal of everything we must do must ultimately be the reconciliation that brings us together across all of our differences, across all of our variety, so that we help to create what looks like God's beloved community on earth. Well, Bishop Akiyama, I'd like to ask you about a very specific way in which the church here in Oregon tried to get involved but ran into a hurdle, and that's in Brookings at St. Timothy's Episcopal Church. Sued the city um, earlier this year. The church says the city is interfering with its faith by limiting the number of meals that they can give to people who are experiencing homelessness, which is a major problem here in Oregon. So how do you balance that mandate to serve the needy with constraints of laws laws of men <laughs> in places like this in in the situation in brookings uh, what we realized was that the neighbors were becoming more and more upset by the feeding ministry that was taking place on the church grounds and complained to the city and the city then began to rearrange city ordinances to figure out a way to limit uh, the way in which we could feed the homeless. So there was no law in place. It was um, suddenly some, some work that was being done on the part of the, the city council to limit our, our ability to serve the, the needy. And that was a reason for the lawsuit, to uh, protect our, our religious freedom, to exercise a ministry as we feel called to do so. What kind of an outcome do you want to see? That we can continue feeding people six days a week yeah. that we have been doing for years. How do you feel about the fact that you have to provide this social safety net at all? Isn't this a failing of our government? But the church is called to help those in need. The church is called to offer a critical voice to inquire into why it is that systems are making producing so many more vulnerable people that um, we are, and many of our churches are already feeling overtaxed with the, the feeding that they're doing. The crisis is so enormous. So yes, there is, there is definitely a need to speak to the systems and the way in which they are or are not actually helping people in need. Our first priority, however, is to serve those in need and to be there on the front line and to help those who need food today, need a shower, need medical attention, need a place to sleep. You know, the church uh, is eager to confront some hard truths about its own history. And in 2006, your general convention adapted resolutions, including studying the church's own complicity in the slave trade and even supporting legislation for reparations for slavery. Uh, I'd like to ask you, Bishop Curry, how's that going? Well, we're, we're moving forward, but we're moving forward in the way of love, because that's what this is about. It is, this is about how do we learn how to love each other so much that we work and labor to create a humane and just society for all of us, for everybody. And, and so that work has actually continued in our last general convention, which met in a cold way. Um, I mean, I'm coming in. You're good. No, it's good. Yep. Uh, that, that we met um, in our general convention in July. At that general convention, um, the convention approved extension, further extension of that work, and made a commitment um, uh, to form um, a coalition on racial uh, justice and equity um, to be a permanent um, entity of the church um, and actually to be the source that will guide the expenditure of funds that will actually produce that kind of justice and reconciliation work uh, across the, the board where there has been racial 
Um, it's not just black and white, but, but indigenous, um, Asian American, um, LGBTQ, wh whoever, anybody who's been displaced because of our sinful selfishness, not just in the church, but in society. Um, and so the church made a commitment, didn't na nail it down specifically to the dollar amounts, but a commitment that this would transcend um, just our every three-year convention meeting. This isn't going to be the usual budget thing. So we were going to make a serious financial commitment of the resources of the Episcopal Church over time to do this work, that I retire in two years. This work must continue. If it stops, we have failed. It must continue no matter who the presiding bishop is and no matter what their color is. It must continue because we follow Jesus and we are committed to make the dream of God, as our Bishop Desmond Tutu says, a reality for everybody in this country and, and countries where the Episcopal Church. So we've actually extended that work even further, and the Episcopal Church is on the verge of making a major both financial and spiritual commitment to this work beyond transcending generations. And that may be That's a church moving, that's the soul. That's the soul of the church and its leadership saying we're serious about this and even if the work must go on when we're gone, it must go on and we will put the financial resources behind it to make it happen. I'm so proud of this church, not in a prideful, sinful way. I'm proud of a church that, yeah, we've got some history. Yeah, Episcopalians were slaveholders in the 18th and 19th century, but doggone it, we're not going to get stuck there. We're going to do what we can to change this land so that all children are children of God and treated that way. We, we, uh, we got some questions from students here on the campus of Oregon Episcopal School, and uh, they're notable for their directness. <laughs> so I'm going to read one for you, okay. word for word. Are you considering reparations for LGBTQ community members who have been harmed over the years? We haven't had that specific discussion, but I'm sure we're headed that way. Okay. I mean, it's, it's just a I mean, question. It's, it's going to be part of that framework that, that you talked it's about right, earlier. For right. the We're already conceptually slavery. working on that, so it's just a question of how that unfolds in time specifically. Yeah, well, this gets at a bigger question, which is how the young people who are members of the church are pushing you in a way that your more established members aren't. I mean, there's this interesting schism that sometimes opens up between generations about what they value and what they want you to do. So how are the young people pushing you in your church? What do they want you to do? You know, I have to say, it's really both. It's really not just the young people. The people who were voting at General Convention had gray hair like me. <laughs> actually, I mean, you know what I mean? It is, it's actually both, which I think is a sign that the message is, we're wrapping our arms around the message of Jesus in that way. And so, um, you know, I mean, when the Episcopal Church made the decision uh, to ordain and consecrate Bishop Gene Robinson, when we did that, it... That was ahead of the social curve. American society wasn't um, there in terms of LGBTQ rights and that kind of thing. The church actually stepped ahead of the social curve and paid a price for it. I was bishop of, of a southern diocese then. Trust me, there was a price paid for it. Um, people held back money. Um, and LGBTQ folk were, in many places, in many contexts, had to be quiet and hang low. I mean, I can't tell you how many times parents of, of, of LGBTQ folk and, and folk themselves would whisper in my ear, thank you, don't give up. But they had to whisper it. And, but they don't have to do that anymore in North Carolina. Uh, I'm a very church that, well, I won't say go into details, but anyway, a very church that, <laughs> that was not, I wasn't their favorite bishop for a while. And, um, and uh, I said the old joke was, um, you know, when you're a new bishop, uh, it's like you walk on water. You can't do anything wrong. And um, after you make decisions um, that, that everybody doesn't agree with, they say, no, it's not about you walking on water. We don't even know if you can swim. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it's much less. <laughs> and, uh, and, and yet, um, that same church that was really profoundly distressed mm -hmm. um, um, at the consecration of Gene Robinson and when I allowed same-sex blessings in the diocese um, soon after that, 
Um, I know that uh, gay and lesbian folk get married in that church now. So that's what I'm saying. If, if it, sometimes things take time, they take work, and loving ways of lifting up values um, that reflect the gospel. I, I mean, we weren't, that's the Episcopal Church. And so that work of how do we create a context and a church and a world where the love is as large and as wide as the love of God. I, I would also add that many of the so-called gray air in the Episcopal Church leadership were the young people who were pushing the establishment in their day. And I think that in many ways, the young people today speak to that part that is still alive for much of the older leadership in the church. And so we not only welcome it, we recognize, we recognize that, that burning passion for change and for justice and welcome them into, into our conversation, into our midst. Well, another, another student wants to know, Bishop Akiyama, what are you doing about losing many members year by year? And we're having this conversation in Oregon, which is one of the most unchurched states in the country, right? Right. How do you turn that around? Well, it's not about a membership drive. And I think, you know, um, that's kind of a joke, but it's also serious because that's just not who we are as the Episcopal Church. We're not um, going out and um, wrangling people to come into church. Where, where you, the shift is happening is, again, serving those in need. So for many, many decades, the Episcopal Church was more turned inward and uh, looking more at who we were and sustaining ourselves as a, as a body. Now we are turning outward. And um, as my bishop said to me when I was a priest in Hawaii, I'm not worried about butts in pews. I'm worried about spiritual maturity and development and service in the community. What are your relationships in the community? And how are you deepening the faith of the people? Um, the rest will follow. Mm -hmm. But to be hand-wringing over how many people are coming in through the door, I think, is... Um, is a waste of energy. It's, it's not what we're called to be into. Let's talk about the pandemic. Uh, it, uh, it upset everybody's apple cart, but there were many stories in the church of Zoom services and no communion and no choir and all those things. And it's great to see you all back in here. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. But I'm curious about this question, and I'm, I've been asking this of many people in many walks of life and in many industries. What's changed forever? And uh, from your perspective, Bishop Curry, what, what, what is transformed and that is not going to go back because of this experience? Well, ultimately, we don't know yet. Yeah. Because we're in the middle of it. <laughs> we really are. I do think that um, one thing that may have changed, I hope it has anyway, let me say it that way, is that from the experience of Zoom and the experience of having to reach Episcopalians, people who were in church in a different way beyond, if you will, the red doors of our church, beyond the buildings, beyond the physical realities, I think that may have a transformative effect on how we view how we are church. I think very often we have been stuck in our buildings. We've, 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 we've done outreach and we've done service, but often it's still in the buildings. We've done worship, but often it's still in the building. COVID forced us to, fig to think differently and to actually take worship, so to speak, into the cybernetic streets, to, to, to take prayer out into the streets, if you will. Of it. And, and, and while I know that some, that won't last everywhere the same way, I think, I hope, that we will not leave behind the congregation we have met online in our rush back to the buildings, which I want to be back. But wait a minute. We met some new people out there. We met a spiritual hunger out there. We met folk who want to pray out there. And they may never darken the doors of our church, but why shouldn't we pastor them right where they are? Why shouldn't we 
join in worship there, right where they are. What Bible study, prayer group, whatever it is, right where they are. Now, I'm, I know that that's difficult, and it takes, but we've learned some of the skills. I mean, when the pandemic first started, and we were all going online, I remember going on to do morning prayer with, with, with some churches, and I would fish around and wouldn't tell them who I was. I would just sort of fish around and um, and go, and I remember it was really tragic in many cases. I mean, it was, I mean, I mean, the camera was like looking at the ceiling, and you could hear a voice from somewhere else talking. <laughs> but the longer the pandemic went on, we figured out, oh, the camera's supposed to look at the person who's talking. <laughs> we, we did figure it out. We learned something. Unmute yourself. Father. Unmute yourself. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Do not scratch your nose on the you know, camera. And you know, I don't think we're going to unlearn that. I think we've learned something, and if we'll stop and say, wait a minute, what have we learned? And then build on that. We may find out what will last um, the long haul. That's a long way of answering your question. But yeah. Bishop Akiyama, do you have anything you want to add to that? It's funny, um, uh, of so many, comparing the Episcopal Church to so many other Protestant churches, we're probably the ones who are the most, in the past, adamant about never having a TV in the in the nave mm -hmm. the pandemic changed that it sure did yeah. what, what was that about not wanting tv in the nave good it, it, ch it changes the liturgical atmosphere ah. to have a, a screen in there as opposed to being there and reading from and, a book and that's different now oh it's everyone has a screen in <laughs> in, the, in the sanctuary it's true, it's true. <laughs> it's just true. i i would also say that um i, I think there is a there's a danger in um in the virtual uh, the ways we become comfortable with virtual participation. And uh, the thing that concerns me is the way in which we may try to make virtual participation uh, um, actual a substitute for the longing that we feel, mm -hmm. and that there's no substitute for being together in person yeah. and, and uh, understanding what we mean to each other in person. Mm -hmm. And that, um, that can never be replaced. And so my hope is that we don't move into a, a frame of mind where we believe that somehow being in a virtual reality you know, replaces fully and wholly what it means to be in person in worship together. But still, as I mentioned earlier, um, Oregon is one of the most unchurched parts of, this, of the country. You know, we, the attendance rates are lower here than just about everywhere. Wh why, why do you think that is? What's going on here? Don't tell me what to do. <laughs> <laughs> a rugged individualist. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean that pretty much sums it up. Yeah. We we want to think for ourselves. We don't want anyone to be the boss of us, and um, you know, want to figure it out on our own. Yet, we long for community, and so there is. It it isn't to say that being unchurched means there's a bunch of people who are happily hermits there is a longing for community. And the way in which the church provides community, builds community, helps people understand what it means to be in community will make the difference as to whether people actually want to join us or not. Mm -hmm. Bishop Curry of the church came out with a um, survey called Jesus in America earlier this year. And the big finding is people have no problem with Jesus as a spiritual figure. They have a problem with the church as a problematic vehicle for teaching Christian values. So what do you take away from that? Well, I, actually, I take away some real hope. And the reason I do is, one, um, the survey, um, and we, we actually did, we'd never done this before, um, to really get a survey and find out what the American population, and to spend the money, I mean, we were able to get the church rate, spend the money um, <laughs> to get professionals who do this work to actually give us a snapshot of the American population, a scientific survey, and that's what that was. The remarkable discovery was that 84% of the American population across religious traditions, across backgrounds, said that Jesus of Nazareth is some, a spiritual person worth paying attention to. That's stunning. <laughs> that I didn't anticipate ahead of time. That's stunning. Jesus gets respect. That's the good news. <laughs> <laughs> But there's more news, not necessarily fit the print, but there's more news <laughs> that when you started asking about Christians um, around race, around environmental concern, um, around a cluster of issues, cluster of concerns, 
that number, percentage uh, proving of Christians and behavior drops below 50% consistently and goes as low as 30% thinking they're Christians. That's, so there is a gap, and that gap between Jesus and his followers is the gap that we must attend to. And that's where what Bishop Akiyama was just talking about a couple of minutes ago is actually true. The more people see Christians actually acting like Christians, the more that people see Christians actually serving and doing stuff that actually helps other people, the more they see that, the, the more they see us looking like Jesus, the more commendable this faith is, even in contexts where people aren't inclined toward faith. The more they see him in us, I mean the real Jesus of Nazareth, um, not the cultural um, icons, if you will, uh, the more folks see that, then the, it, this is sort of like since uh, in, 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 uh, in honor of Queen Elizabeth, you know, in Britain they have the, in the, ton, in the, the subway, the underground, um, they have this thing, mind the gap, remember that from some years ago, and what that's about is the gap between the, the platform and where the train is, there, there actually, if you've been in the underground, there actually is a gap, and depending on where you are, it could be wider or less. Um, and mind the gap means pay attention to the gap. If you want to get on the subway and get on it safely, pay attention to the gap. If we want to make a difference in the hearts of people, pay attention to the gap between Jesus and how Christians actually live and care about other people. The more we care about people and not just ourselves and not just our survival as a church, the more people will pay attention. Maybe this, maybe this Jesus actually does have something to do with these people who are named after him and called Christians. But there are a couple of other things that are at work here, and that is the, the gathering evangelical movement in America of people who agree with everything you say but want to have a direct relationship with their creator and with their Christ and may not want to have anything to do with the two of you, you know, in that they want a direct line to who they consider to be their considered to be their God. You know, the also, Bible says you, know, you can't love the God you can't see if you do not love your brother and sister who you can see. Mm -hmm. That includes your LGBTQ <laughs> brother and sister. <laughs> that you see what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. I, go ahead. I interrupted you. I'm sorry. But, well, and there's also yeah. this, this broader erosion of, of trust in our institutions in America, the mm. church, but also <laughs> our governments, our schools, on down the line. So how do you get around that? I don't worry about that. I think Bishop Akiyama was actually right. The issue is community. The more we think of the church as an institutional embodiment, an institution, the less credible it will be. The more we think of the church and experience it as a community of people that sometimes has institutions. A school is an institution, and we need that. But, but the church is a community of people who are trying to follow in the way of Jesus of Nazareth in the way of God's love. The more people see that, that's a different ball game. We fall into a trap when we keep trying to push the church into being a religious institution and that that's the main way we are identified. No, the church is people who have decided they're going to try to love like Jesus and try to live like Jesus even though we won't always do it right. But we're going to keep trying. And that, it seems to me, commends itself. I was a priest in, in the middle, in the in, uh, Center City, Baltimore, before I became a bishop, became bishop in North Carolina. And we were dealing with real gang, um, the issues of gangs, um, and, and kids caught up, and it was related to drug trade and all of that. This is in the 90s. And um, I don't know what made me realize it, but I realized at one point that gangs were a substitute family. Mm -hmm. As tough as some of these guys were, and I, some of them were tough, and, we, you know, as tough as they were, they were longing for a family. And in that gang, they found it. And I realized we missed the mark in the church. They were looking for community, for family, a place where I'm loved and cared for, where I'm affirmed, even if they don't use the word love, where I'm affirmed as a person. And they found it in street gangs and never realized they could find it in Christian communities. That Christian community, that's where what we call the church now came from in the first place. It didn't start out as, I'm going to get in trouble, I won't, I don't know. <laughs> All right. <laughs> it didn't start out as an institution. Um, as Albert Nolan from South Africa um, um, said, Jesus did not found an institution. 
he began a movement. Mm -hmm. The more we reclaim that movement and being that, we will find our soul and we may mind the gap and close the gap between us and Jesus. Bishop there, there's, um, um, I think, an assumption that when we say all our institutions are collapsing, that we need to get busy and paste them all back together again or quickly find the solution. We're right in the middle of it. Um, we don't know how this is going to end. And as my spiritual director said to me some years ago when we were talking about this exact same topic, she said, I think our call is to surf the chaos. Mm. We surf the chaos. We don't um, presume to know the answer. We can't predict the future. But we keep on keeping on as Christians, loving one another and helping each other. Another question from a student. I love these. <laughs> and a child shall lead them. Right? <laughs> what is the church doing about systemic issues around racism? Very big question. <laughs> we, we, this diocese has a group called the Engaging Racial Justice Working Group. There's also a Truth and Reconciliation Group that is spending a lot of time thinking about what it is we need to do within this diocese to engage racial justice, which isn't just about relationships across differences, it's about looking at our history. So what is the history of Oregon around race? And how has that shaped us as a, as a people? What it's is not it? good. <laughs> no, it's not, mm -mm. it's not. But really living into that and, and being honest about the ways in which racism, white supremacy, has uh, shaped the landscape of this state and and naming it and finding a way forward after having done that so that we can not repeat the, the mistakes of the past and move forward in a different, more life-giving way. Bishop Curry, you became famous um, for your sermon at the wedding of Prince Harry and Meghan Markle. <laughs> you, you brought an energy that was not there until you started speaking. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's a nice way to say that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, I mention it because uh, the prince's grandmother just died. And in that sermon you said, if humanity ever captures the energy of love, it will be the second time in history that we have discovered fire. What did you mean by that? It was a quote from uh, Pierre Théo de Chardin, uh, who was a Roman Catholic, he was a Jesuit. Um, but he was also a paleontologist, a scientist. Um, um, and um, he was basically saying that the discovery of fire really was one of the significant discoveries in the realization of human civilization. And the truth is, civilization as we know it, in any way, shape, manner, or form, is impossible. You don't get a Bronze Age, you don't get an Iron Age. The Industrial Me Revolution was a mixed bag, but, <laughs> but, you, but you don't get... Um, you know, I flew here on Delta Airlines, unless there's fire, controlled fire, controlled burns, and you don't go anywhere. That NASA um, um, rocket that's supposed to go up eventually, they got to make sure they've got those controlled burns, right? You know what I mean? So fire was, I mean, it made cooking possible, it would reduce disease, it made um, using uh, fire for warmth, which meant human migration around the planet became possible. Um, I mean, there's all sorts of things that became possible because of fire. And what uh, de Chardin was saying was that if humanity ever harnesses the energy, what he, the phrase he used was the energies of love, he said it'd be the second time in human history that human beings had discovered fire. And that, what he meant was that, to create a new, a way of being human that is humane. Um, that's powerful stuff. And so that's what I meant by that. That's what I was stealing from yeah. de Chardin. I gave him credit. Yeah. Um, said it a little differently than he would have, but nonetheless. <laughs> <laughs> How did your life change after that sermon? Um, well, I mean, I, well, in, in funny kind of, in wonderful ways. One, um, it did give me a chance to, to speak about what Christianity is really about and not what it's popularly understood to be about. That it, that is, it is not a self-serving, selfish endeavor. That it is about the kind of love that is unselfish living that actually is committed to living and seeking the good and the well-being of others as well as the self. 
it seems to me that that's a message that, um, does, that sometimes gets obscured um, when sometimes Christians spend more time putting people down than figuring out how do we raise everybody up. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? And, and so I, it gave me, and I had an opportunity to say that and to talk about that kind of stuff. So it changed in that respect. Um, also ch changed in, in, in funny ways. Um, I found myself in a lot of conversations on airplanes, um, <laughs> <laughs> which, which I hadn't anticipated. But you know what? That was also opportunities to take a selfie and have a conversation. And um, you know, I said, well, that's the vocation I'm supposed to do anyway, so why not do it? And so that, that and I think if nothing else, it helped many people spell the name Episcopal. <laughs> <laughs> And, and I hope and pray that it was, you know, it was um, an opportunity to speak to beyond what I knew. I had no idea. I mean, what was really a worldwide audience. Um, There's a bigger congregation than I've ever spoke to. And I, I've been around the globe just doing what I'm supposed to do, and people have talked to me about that sermon around the world. And, and even in some context where people are not particularly pleased with us in the Episcopal <laughs> Church, um, <laughs> that sermon actually helped um, to, to improve relationships, um, um, even in our Anglican community. I mean, so, so it was helpful, and I hope it was helpful to, to, to the couple and the family. Um, <laughs> I mean, I went over time, the time limit they had given me, but that was, <laughs> <laughs> they were on the British time zone, I was on the American time zone, and I, I mean, that was the difference. Ho hope it helped. Yeah. Hope it helped. Well, speaking of the British royal family, um, I, if people think of the Episcopal Church, they may recognize that there is some connection to the Church of England, and they may not understand that completely. Um, now, we know that there's, there's been a great separation a war was fought, you know? <laughs> not, not recently, it was a not while really, back. It was a while yeah, ago. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's not the same, but Her Majesty has just always been kind of in the background, you know? Is it going to change at all with a new monarch? Is the church, the Episcopal Church in America, is anything going to change? Because of? Because that there's now a King Charles and not a, and not a, and not a Queen Elizabeth. I would doubt it. Um, and the only reason I say that is we have a filial relationship. Um, the Church of England and the, Episcopal, the Scottish Episcopal Church, um, the Episcopal Church in this country descends from those two churches. Um, it actually does. Um, I sometimes like to say we are the child of two mothers. But anyway, that's a whole other <laughs> issue. <laughs> we actually are. Um, and, and so that's a filial relationship. But the Anglican Communion is made up of autonomous churches, what are called provincial, which are often national churches, but provincial churches. And so the Episcopal Church is one province among many, so that the Church of England is one province. The, um, the Church in Wales is a province. The Church of Scotland is a province. The various churches on the African continent and in parts of Asia, in the Pacific Rim, um, in uh, Central, Amer Central and South America, the, um, and, and in parts of Asia, when you get up Korea, Japan, um, Taiwan's in the Episcopal Church, in the Episcopal Church but um, our independent provinces, Pakistan, um, um, the two churches, North and South India. Um, so the Anglican Communion, unlike the Roman Catholic Church, is made up of autonomous, if you will, churches. Now, we're autonomous, but in, in, in intercommunion and relationship. That's very different than a governmental, you see what I mean, relationship. So, um, we all love the queen. We did. I mean, now, Americans love the monarchy. We fought a revolution over that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and we said, well, but we like her. <laughs> you know? And I'm sure Americans will grow to like Philip, too. But, uh, but there's actually no more of a relationship legally between it there, than there is between the state and, and the crown. We're, we're not... Um, we're not one of the realms and territories mm -hmm. or members of the Commonwealth. And the Episcopal Church is part of the Anglican Communion, but uh, the, the Queen is honored and, and loved, uh, was honored and loved, and I'm sure uh, King Charles, I keep calling him Prince Charles, King, King Charles, will be honored and loved. But they don't dabble 
into them. When we consecrated Gene Robinson, we had the authority to do that, even if the whole Anglican community disagreed with us. That, that's, that, that's how it works. So it, it. Uh, I've got, we've got a few, more, a few more minutes, and I'd like to ask you both just a, a good way to, a good way of, of thinking about your role uh, in this moment and, and the way forward. I, I'm curious, what, what gives you hope in this moment? Uh, and what gives you hope for the role of the church in some of these very difficult and intractable issues that we have been talking about today? And Bishop Akiyama, I'd like to start with you. What gives me hope is actually um, the chaos. Um, mm -hmm. That there are, there, are, uh, there are openings and possibilities for us to do things that we probably could have done 20 years ago, but would not have done because we were too comfortable. Um, the, I'm quite confident in saying that 20 years ago the church would not have elected someone like me to be a bishop and um, the opportunity that comes out of the changes along with the chaos uh, has made that possible and we are looking at in this diocese an opportunity to do very innovative creative things maybe because um, we are not really we have never really felt like we were like part of the establishment of the, of the political power system of the state of Oregon. So we have a lot of latitude to move and, and seek to serve others as Jesus calls us to do. There is one of the things that was so exciting for me when I began my work here was coming to meet all the clergy and lay leaders in this diocese and getting so inspired and excited by how talented uh, they are, how creative, how innovative, how much energy they have. It really doesn't matter um, how old anyone is. It's it, their spirit and excitement about what the church can be and do for this state and into the future is, is a fire, and it's exciting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Bishop Curry, final word, what gives you hope in this moment? You know what ultimately gives me hope? God is not finished with us yet. And I actually believe that. And I believe that about this country and this world. That God has not given up on this world. And he's not given up on this country. And if God has not given up on this old church of ours, we, we, we have difficult days ahead. I'm not just talking about the church. I mean, I'm, I mean this country. I love this country. Uh, I don't love everything it's done. But this is my home. And I love it, not in a blind patriotism. But I really do believe that a, a democratic republic has the best possibility of creating a truly diverse community that is actually a community. It has the best possibility, I believe, of creating a context where human rights can flourish. Totalitarianism has never done that. Fascism has never done that. But the very democracy that could make that, make that possible, and has made it possible in the past, is in jeopardy. But I'm hopeful because I'm convinced that if people of goodwill across the political persuasions, and I'm here to tell you, Episcopalians are all over the map. I know, I get their email. Trust me, <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, they're all over. But people of goodwill come in all stripes and types. And that if people of goodwill will mobilize, we're not going to let this democracy tank. We are going to make e pluribus unum from many one real until this country is a country where there is really liberty and justice for all. That gives me hope. Presiding Bishop Michael Curry, Bishop Diana Akiyama, it was an absolute pleasure talking with you. Thank you so much. You brother. Thank you.
Thank you so much, you guys. That was really, truly fantastic. All three of you, even you, Jeff, you did a great job. <laughs> <laughs> it was such a treat, it, really, truly a treat, to have all of your thinking right here. And there are some students here, which just makes me thrilled because I think, um, you know, you make us proud to be an Episcopal school. So, by the way, I'm Mo Copeland. I'm the head of the school here. I get to be part of this community, and it really is a fantastic and wonderful community, and we are so thrilled to be able to host you guys and have you on the campus. So much of what they talked about is truly at the heart of our school. Uh, one, of our, one of the things we talk about all the time is the power for good, and we're trying to create students who are going to move into the world and use their power for good. And we talk about community all the time, that that's how you actually grow those commitments to each other is to really build it through community. So it was truly a delight. Thank you so much for being here.